Hi, I'm Sherilyn Smith. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor at the University of Washington. And in this video, we're going to be talking about enteroviruses, which are ubiquitous viruses and capable of producing mild and severe disease. Polio, an enterovirus that causes paralytic neurologic disease, serves as a reminder that effective public health interventions can have long-lasting effects on human health and disease. Here are the learning objectives. To outline the classification and basic viral structure of enteroviruses, discuss how these factors relate to epidemiology and spread, discuss the immune response to enteroviruses, including viral recognition by pattern recognition receptors, the antiviral immune response in general, and type 1 interferons. Here is the course map linking back to enteroviruses. This is Avery. She is four days old, and yesterday, her parents noticed that she wasn't eating as well as she had been, and this morning she started crying, and they couldn't calm her down. They thought that she felt warm, and they found out she had a fever. She was brought to her pediatrician's office, who admitted her to the hospital because she was so ill. Her mother, father, both had colds, as did her older brother. When Avery had testing to find out why she was ill, her doctors found out that she had evidence of meningitis. Ultimately, she was diagnosed with enteroviral meningitis. While she was in the hospital, she had high fevers and really wasn't able to eat and was very irritable. She was there for four days until her fever went away and she started eating again. Ultimately, she recovered completely. Her uh, story tells us why we care about enteroviral infection and gives a little clue about who is susceptible to this infection. So first, I'd like to talk about the basic biology of enteroviruses. Enteroviruses are small RNA viruses that belong to the picornavirus family of viruses. The word picornavirus is derived from the word pico, meaning small. Other viruses in this family include hepatitis A and rhinovirus. Humans are the only natural hosts for enterovirus, and this factor has implications for transmission and control. There are more than 100 types of enterovirus with four main species grouped by genetic sequences. You will hear people describing the viruses this way. For example, enterovirus D68 caused a recent outbreak of illness in the United States. When you talk to some clinicians, they may also use older categories to describe the viruses, which do not really align with genetics. These biologic categories were created by grouping viruses together that cause similar diseases. The problem with this approach is that there is significant overlap between the types of illnesses different enteroviruses can cause. This is just a heads up for you so you don't get confused in the future. Some of the most common labels that you will hear are Coxsackie viruses, echoviruses, enteroviruses, and polioviruses. Since enteroviruses are RNA viruses, their life cycle is pretty typical of RNA viruses. They attach to the cell surface via specialized receptors, for instance, CD155 for polio, um, and are endocytosed. The replication and assembly of the virus occurs exclusively in the cytoplasm, and the viral RNA polymerase is the key enzyme needed for viral replication. The virus is subsequently packaged and released. The release of the viruses cause cell death, and the viral particles are immediately infectious. So the clinical correlations of this are, since viral rep replication is relatively simple, uh, there are not a lot of targets for therapy. In addition, there are significant similarities in the enteroviral genomes in the different groups. Since enterovirus commonly causes disease, this was one of the reasons that it was the, one of the earliest diagnostic PCRs to be developed. This really has changed the management of patients with common disease manifestations like meningitis. The similarities between groups may also be a limitation because some of the tests may not distinguish between enteroviruses and similar viruses, like rhinovirus, which causes the common cold. I want to talk about how enteroviruses cause disease. They can infect both the GI and respiratory tract. I'll talk about each one separately for clarity. The virus is shed from the GI or respiratory tract of a patient. This virus is immediately infectious. Initial infection happens in the epithelial cells of the upper respiratory tract, or oral pharynx. There is local replication of the virus within those cells. The virus then subsequently infects and then replicates in the local submucosal lymphoid tissue. If the initial infection is in the gastrointestinal tract, again primarily the oral pharynx, 
there is that initial replication of the, in the epithelial cells, new virus is shed and swallowed. The virus resists breakdown by stomach acid, which means it's acid stable, and this allows it to move into the intestines, where it subsequently infects the submucosal lymphoid tissue, specifically the pyrus patches. Once the virus replicates in the submucosal lymphoid tissue, there is primary viremia with additional replication in the lymph nodes, spleen, liver, and bone marrow. This is followed by a secondary viremia and infection of additional organs like the central nervous system, heart, and skin. Now, let's talk a little bit about the immune response to enterovirus so we can link viral pathogenesis, the immune response, and clinical manifestations. The first line of defense against viral pathogens is the innate immune system, which recognizes viral proteins as non-self. This initial recognition of non-self is mediated by pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. The PRRs are glycoprotein mo molecules that are found on many cells involved in the innate immune response. They are so named because they recognize and bind to pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMs. Molecular components associated with microorganisms but not found as part of a eukaryotic cell. The toll-like receptor 3, or TLR3, is the most important PRR for enterovirus. So toll-like receptors are expressed on both the cell surfaces or in endosomes where they can interact with antigens. Uh, TLR3 is in endosomes of T, B, dendritic, and NK cells where it can interact with viral antigens after the virus is endocytosed. When a virus is recognized by TLR3, there is an activation of a series of transcription factors that result in inflammation. NF-kappa B activates transcription of a large number of proteins, including cytokines, chemokines, and adhesion molecules. Interferon response factors control the expression of interferons, which are critical to stop viral replication. Type 1 interferons increase natural killer cell activity and activate uh, cells of the adaptive immune system, such as antigen-presenting cells, um, like dendritic cells, or CD4 and CD8 T cells, in part by upregulating the expression of MHC molecules. They also directly limit viral replication through disruption of viral replication processes and signaling adjacent cells to undergo apoptosis. We know that a humoral immune response is critical for the control of infection, mainly through studies in people with immunodeficiencies and through vaccine trials. There are two places antibodies are important. One at the mucosal surface, primarily secretory IgA, that, if present, can stop infection. The other is in the serum, where antibodies act to inhibit virus that is circulating. These antibodies are present if you have been exposed to the virus previously, have been immunized, or they occur during the second vi secondary viremia that happens later in the course of the Ill infection. So why do people get sick with enteroviruses? The first time a patient is exposed to a virus, there isn't any adaptive immune response early in the infection, and it isn't until viral replication in the submucosal lymphoid, uh, lymph nodes that the innate immune system is engaged. The only way to prevent infection at this point is if secretary, secretory IgA is present from immunization or previous infection. You can see from this slide where the various parts of the immune system interact with the virus to limit spread. Control during primary viremia results in asymptomatic infection. This is due largely to an effective innate response or presence of antibodies from previous infection or immunization. If there is no control, there is additional replication and the patient develops fever during the secondary viremia. If replication is stopped there, only fever occurs. If there is no control, there is additional spread and disease occurs. So not everyone presents the same way with this illness, and some people have increased risk for disease. Young children, like Avery, are at particular risk, likely because of their impaired immune response. You can see in the slide that infants, who are less than a year of age, have the highest number of deaths and the largest number of infections. In addition, we know that patients who do not have antibodies will develop persistent meningitis because they cannot clear the infection without neutralizing antibodies. Finally, stem cell transplant patients with multiple defects in their immune response develop multi-organ disease, including infection of the heart, lungs, and central nervous system. In summary, 
Enteroviruses are very, very common and are RNA viruses. Pattern recognition receptors are important for the initiation of the immune response and the humoral immune response is critical for the control of infection. Because of the effectiveness of the immune response and the ubiquitous nature of the virus, most infections are asymptomatic. If there is no control, the secondary viremia produces fever and leads to end-organ infection.